So Imtiaz is joining me today. He went to the Olympics at Sydney. And uh, Imtiaz, a big moment, a big, a big coincidence, your book coming out and Fahad Mirza making it to the Olympics after, after you for the first time. Yeah, it's uh, 20 years and uh, yeah. very, very excited. So at least, you know, it's kept the uh, thing going, you know, so that there are going to be many more hopefully after this. Of course. So, so I'm very excited to have Imtiaz here. I haven't seen him in a very, very long time. <laughs> but uh, the fact that he's also here is uh, because A, he's an Olympian. B, we've done fairly well in equestrian this time. At least it's come into that. I mean, it's it's not mainstream yet, Imtiaz, but at least in that tier, second tier, you know, going towards the first along with golf and Aditya Ashok. And of course, he's come out with a book, Riding Free, which has been a fascinating read. Imtiaz, you want, if you have the book, you're most welcome to uh, put it up. And yes, so Imtiaz's book, Riding Free, is available on Amazon, I'm presuming, uh, maybe Flipkart and, as well, Imtiaz? Yes, and, and on bookstores as well, from Oxford to uh, Cambridge, uh, you know, crosswords Everywhere. and everything. Yeah. Okay, so wonderful. That is, uh, please go get his book because if you, you know, as a, as a country, Imtiaz, we actually tend to sit and look at the end results. We tend to sit and look at how many medals have come and we forget the stories. We forget all those people who've come fourth, fifth and sixth in the middle. And I think Imtiaz's book is going to tell you what it really takes to reach the Olympics, the kind of inspiration you need, the kind of uh, passion you need to be in the sport and not just to be sitting on the couches like the rest of us. Uh, so Imtiaz, I'm going to begin by asking you that you started horse riding at the age of four. You know, by, by, many, uh, by many conventional age groups, that is fairly young for any sport. So how did you kind of get into horse riding? Per se. Well, it was something my parents and my parents did, you know, my grandfather and my mother as well, you know, they were all uh, avid horse people. So we went to the, you know, riding club every day and we were, so I was associated. I would not say actually I was riding at four, but I was actually introduced to the horse at four, you know, so I would pet it, groom it, and I would take it that, you know, uh, with, the, with the groom holding me and I would be just sitting on him, just about, just about hanging on, you know. But that passion came in at that time. I just loved the animal and I would spend hours and hours with it even uh, not riding, just in its stable. So uh, somebody just asked me, uh, Imtiaz's book's name is Riding Free. He just showed it up. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Flipkart or in any of the bookstores near you. So Imtiaz, when did that actually change into the kind of passion that you need to actually seriously pursue a sport that eventually leads up to the Olympics? So you know, the passion always stays with you. I mean, it was always something I wanted to represent India. That was my thing. You know, just ever since I was a kid, I would be doing victory, victory laps and I would give thank you speeches and anybody I met, I would make a note of them. You know, when I was young, you know, even at seven years old, I would write down when, when I win my medal, I have to thank them, you know, because I must not forget because they bought me lunch or whatever, you know. So that was something I always dreamt. I didn't even know which sport, Josna. So when I was young, I was quite a good runner. So I thought, you know, because I do it in running, you know, because I thought Carl Lewis made five gold medals, I can definitely win one, you know. Uh, then I went off to boarding school and I was quite good at swimming. So I thought maybe I would be a swimmer. Uh, I then realized I wasn't fast enough, you know. So, but, but the passion was always there with horses. So, but I, I didn't really know how this whole thing would really come about because, you know, I was a little Indian boy thinking that I'm going to make it in a question that just won't happen because there's no sport. The sport doesn't exist at that level in this country, you know. But again, like how things would happen in life, and that's what the book is about. I had this phenomenal coach and mentor that came into my life. And that's when I started believing. So I was about 11 years old and I thought, you know, this could be possible. You know, I could be an equestrian. I could do it, in a, you know. And, uh, and, and the amazing part is she trained me when I was 11 years old till I was 30. So 20 years, I had the same coach, same person with no money exchange, just from the goodwill of her heart. And, you know, she was a, her husband was posted in India. So she was here, you know, during the summer and I would train with her. No, that, that's actually fascinating. Uh, you know, it's also about giving back eventually, which you are, uh, you, you, you know, you, you take and then you give back. There's a time for both the things. And I think you're giving back equally in terms of uh, training with your training school and your mentorship that goes across uh, various age groups. But do, how do you find the acceptance for the sport? Has it changed now? I mean, it's taken 20 years since you went to the Olympics at Sydney for Fawad Mirza to come up and some kind of, and the spotlight, to be honest, was only because, you know, he was doing well to begin with. 
No, I think it has grown definitely. When I started riding, uh, you know, as it says also in the book, I was the only civilian. You know, it was an army-dominated sport. Most of the events were only only held in army cantonment areas. So it was very hard, very difficult. It was not even accessible. Uh, you know, I don't even know how my parents allowed me. I would be traveling with my horse and open trucks from Delhi to Jalandhar to even places like Bihar because I just wanted it so bad. So I didn't matter where I went. You know, in those days, there were no cell phones. I was not calling my parents to say where I was. They didn't even know where I was. You know, stopping at Dhaba, get off. Uh, you know, those were the things that school, Sana helped me. You know, so I could I could be be able to do those things. You know, so every stage in your life plays a role. You don't realize it at that time, but eventually you realize how important it was. It really made a, something out of me. You know, because I was a timid boy, I wasn't an aggressive person. You know, I came from a priv- somewhat privileged background from Bombay, but to really push myself, uh, you know, these sort of situations happen. Coming back, I, I got a bit uh, digressed, but coming back to your question, it's changed now. In over 20 years now, we have a lot of civilians competitions. Civilians are riding. There are riding clubs all over in the two-tier cities. You know, it used to be only in Bombay, Delhi, and Calcutta, more like an offshoot of the horse racing that the British left. Now it is in Chandigarh, Amritsar, Pune, uh, you know, Bang, all these small sport places, even other smaller places like Jaipur, and uh, you know, they all have riding clubs and riding centers. And when you go to a national competition, there were 1,000 to 1,500 kids competing at every show. So it has grown, definitely. But how do you make it? Uh, is, is there any possibility of making it a mass sport for this? And I, I'm giving you an example. The other day, Aditi Ashok, she tweeted something about how, you know, you can, you can make... A, you can make golf reach the masses in a sense that, you know, the, the kind of advice or, instru- you know, input she was yes. giving. And, and she was immediately trolled. And it was very unfortunate because all she was saying is how, you know, how we can just get golf to more places, to more cities, to more towns. And she was immediately trolled because it was not a conventional sport. And this is what we do. We were clapping when she was almost getting a medal. Now things are done. It's over. She's gone off. And we, we, we're back to wherever we're going to get the medals from. It's very tough, no, that's, right? You know, that's the sad part with everything in India. You know, like what I, what even I gave some press interviews the other day. And, and I was quite openly about it. I said, you know, all these medals, it's all, all very good and well. And they're all rewarded after. What about the four years? What about the sacrifices? And I said, you've got to keep the momentum going from now for the next three years, you know? And, you know, just tell you how negative people can get. You know, by mistake, I said for the next four years, because the Olympics are held every four years, it's only because of the pandemic it got to, it's become three years. And somebody said, well, it's not four years, it's three years. I'm like, this is my point. This is exactly my point. You'll catch on the negative of everything, you know? Look at the positive. We have people in fencing. We have people in sailing this year, equestrian, golf. Sports that we're all unconventional, and that's where javelin throwing. We won our gold medal in something that we are not known for, you know. So this is where we have to realize that it's any sport. It doesn't really matter. And I want to tell parents also for their children, you know, let them live their dream. Don't tell them it's you know they have to become a doctor, they have to become an engineer. If they want to do sport. Cricket is the only option. So it's already cut, com, uh, compartmentalized. You know, that's not the way we live life. Look at what we are doing today. You know, uh, we were in school together. We never thought of like we would be doing this yeah. chat. Because we thought yes. differently. We, think, we, we did things that we followed our passion and what we love doing, you know. And it, that's the way we have to live life for us to be successful. Because success will come when you enjoy it. Because that's what drives you. Absolutely. So, I mean, when you're talking about school and we were in school together, and yes, I, I, I don't really, I, I was trying to think, think about this the other day and I'm like, oh my God, I don't remember. Maybe I remember a little bit of horse riding. Maybe I don't. And <laughs> so, so going back to school, how was it for you? Uh, I mean, it, no, it, it was a lull, right? Yeah, it was very tough for me because, one, I was very homesick as a kid. You know, I, I, you know, it was really tough coming from Bombay and then going into the school. And, you know, I, had to, and I was really homesick. So it took me a while to get used to that. But that taught me so much today. You know, like, it, it, you know, that's the one thing good about these sort of schools. You know, they were old institutions. They were, there's a system in place, you know, and we had friends and support teams. And that's what my book is all about. It's the amount of support I got from everybody around me. Even till today, our school group, our school chat, it's all supportive. And that's what I want to tell. Another story I want to tell people. There are many stories I like to tell people. But it's one is yeah, that you know, surround yourself with positive people, you know. Like when I, in, in my book also, like, as you know, that there are many failures. In fact, there are more failures than successes. But one of the major failures, always people say, how did you overcome it? I overcome it because I had people around me who asked me, like my parents, first thing when my first debacle happened at the Asian Games, they said, you know, what do you want? And my first answer was, I want to ride. And my parents said, get back in the saddle. That was it. They didn't say, you know, you've already done, you've, you've achieved everything, you did the trials, you actually did get selected, you, you got the India jacket. Okay, this is politics and bureaucracy that didn't get you there. I don't know. That was not options. Mine was, this is what you want. There's no other option. Get back in the saddle and let's go. We're going to figure out a way and we're going to do it. And it's very tough, isn't it? 
uh, the, yeah. the 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 lows that come. I was speaking to uh, this other athlete. I'm not going to mention her, uh, but uh, yeah. she's one of our top para, uh, Paralympic athletes, and she's not going uh, to Tokyo, and she's deeply upset because it's not about the game. And you know yes. how do you how do you then get up? I mean, are you got the kind of support. What happens to people who don't actually? No, it's very hard. I tell you, it's not because you know people like this who do these things, like the like the person you just mentioned. They do it because of their their heart is in the right place. You know, they don't. It's not about financial. It's not about fame. It's not about money. It's not because we don't get the coverage. You know what I mean? It's only if you win a gold medal that you get that kind of coverage. Otherwise, who knows of the other hundred hundred athletes that represented India at the Olympic Games? Nobody knows. They did the same sacrifice. Their families went through the same sacrifice. You know, they all should be heroes because they are only a hundred out of billions. So you can just look at the numbers. When you talk about one hundred people are representing and flying that flag high, they all should be celebrated. So I can understand when a girl like this who didn't even make that hundred, she's lost and forgotten. So it's not like that's the reason she's doing it for. Him. She does it because she wants to. So it's not easy to wake up every day when you have that desire. So again, I keep telling people like that, and I tell people and kids today when things like this happen, you just still have to. Find that goal. Find the right people, and stay with those people because that's what it is. Surround yourself with positive energy. It's important, you know. But if you stand around people who are negative, or you know, it's a pandemic, or we don't have enough water, uh, money, or we don't have enough resources, there's no opportunity. That's where you're going to be, you know. If you look at the positive side. That's uh, so. Uh, before I come back to how you know you you found not just positivity but how the physical aspect of training, I want to ask you one more question, and that is it. it have you seen a kind of change uh you know since when you were when you were in the sport uh, and to now the kind of children who are coming to train with you is there some kind of a different uh, you know the, the outlook is is there some kind of a change today in today's generation towards sports you know i think definitely there is and but the whole thing is that again it's the matter of those who really have the have it in them or not and i tell yeah. people and i i'm going to tell this again this is something i believe in very strongly so i'm going to say, i'm going to say hard work beats talent always 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 so you see a lot of kids even in my time they are talented you know but they don't have the work ethic they don't have the hard work you see it even when you go to school or go to college the front benchers are not always the most successful ones in school in in life you know because they may have all the grades and it comes easy to but they don't put the work ethic they don't have the you know so you got to have a balance when you're a sports person you got to have the talent to a certain extent you got to have the work ethic you got to have the uh, resilience you got to be you know you got to be uh, so focused and passionate you know and then you got to have that little mongrel in you you got to have that little aggressive uh, aggression because you want something which is not yours you know what i mean so you got to work hard, you know you got to have you cannot be well it's if it if it comes it happens i have done my best it, those things don't work unfortunately you don't have to overrun somebody but in your own you got to have that little bit you know so it happens and when you find it in a in a student it's unbelievable you just i get so excited yeah you know i say this to my daughter all the time because she is playing badminton just like her mother badminton yes. but uh, the fact is i and i tell her i said you know i i i can point out to the other children who i feel have it in them because there's and i i say this also about sports in india i think it's more yes. now it's got that it, it it's coming more out of the rural belt of the country yes. for reason india because th these are the children who have the drive who are hungry. these are the yeah. families yes they're hungry they want to get out make a better life for themselves sometimes the medal is a bonus absolutely you know it's so true say that even when i run i'm i've got my question school now and i have everybody and i have a, a lovely program for those who can't afford it but just love it and passionate about it that they can do it like a working student which is everywhere in the world like being an intern in an office or a company so i put them into a program and they can come here and most of my students are people from all the interiors no you know i don't have the bombay delhi calcutta i have people from all the smaller and the two tier and the three tier city tier cities that are poured in and they they never every morning they have the same energy we start early 5:30 in the morning i'm up even now you know and at 6 o'clock there's the same amount of vibe in the barn as there would be at 10:30 you know and that's what i love yeah. and there's no nakra you know you you're going to come out yeah, and you, no. they don't look at how they look nothing <laughs> there's that concentration it's amazing absolutely. it's amazing absolutely no i didn't sleep right. last night i didn't have my coffee in the morning yeah. i didn't have my cold coffee wasn't there you know you know <laughs> nothing nothing they just come and get get on with the job what we have a saying yeah. called dwi deal with it you know just move on deal with it <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> that this is one conversation my daughter definitely needs to listen to. No, no, no. To. So no, you're but, my son. Don't worry. It's the same story. Yeah, it is. But no, she she's actually. Uh, I'm I'm worried. She's going to be beating me very soon. But no, it doesn't take much to beat me anymore. No, anyway. no, no. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but Imtiaz, tell me. So what did it take? What kind of a training regime did you go through? Uh, in those so think, years before the Olympics. then those years it's the same it doesn't change the main thing is I you, you just don't take days off you don't slack if, and the family even my parents would say come on come on you you know you haven't seen you in so long come home I would not take a chance because I say no what if I miss out on training you know so it was very focused in our sport we have a horse involved so it's not only you training you got to train your horse so you have to be the physically correct the horse has to be physically strong you have to be mentally there he has to be mentally there your nutrition his nutrition. so there are two things happening at the same time at all times so a lot of planning has to go with there you can't just get up and say well this is what i'm going to do because your horse may not want to do it that day you know so it's always structured with the horse keeping the horse in mind so it's a little bit more technical and in, and in my sport as well because the, the discipline that i did was to, just to people who are on the show it's it's like the triathlon for horses so we have three disciplines we have dressage cross country and show jumping so the horse has to be very versatile very fit so does us you know so a lot has to go into fitness swimming we swim the horses long distances and still we have to do so there's a lot that we put the whole program together but i had wonderful support great great coaches who always supported me and you know i just i was like a sponge i was trying to get as much information uh, as possible and learn as much from whoever people always have this thing you know i can't learn from so and so i can't no everybody everybody's got something to teach you it's what you want to take out of it you don't have to take everything you take what works for you what suits you your personality your strength your stamina your backing everything you got to put all of it together it's not just a 2 plus 2 is 4 you know you got to figure out what what works and make and and it's like a jigsaw puzzle sometimes you know so I find that, I don't know whether it's like, there the are two aspects of it. A, you know, it's not just you who can just pick up your racket and go and play. You've got to take the horse right. along. On the other side, this is this beautiful sport where there is, you know, this immense bonding. This is a man and animal coming together. You know, how do you right. align the two aspects? Oh, it's just a, a bond that you have. I mean, uh, that's what the whole book is about, <laughs> is, is my relationship. Yeah. And that's the reason, one of the reasons I wrote the book as well, is my relationship with the horses. You know, each one was so special to me. And you know what's amazing, Joseph? They came all at the right time. You know what I mean? Like, if you, if you read the book, so like Rajesh came at when I was six years old. You know, he didn't come when I was going to the Olympic Games. He would be the wrong horse, you know? So every horse came in just to take me to the next level. A bit like when you go to school, uh, you know, your first grade teacher does your first grade. Then you go to grade two and your grade two teacher takes so each one one does that little step for you and molds you in a specific way that takes you to the next level so that's what my horses did to me you know they improved me they you know taught me patience they taught me resilience they taught me str everything i learned is from them you know uh, they they just just this amazing amazing animal and the more and more time and that's one thing i really stress on the, the kids that are with me is spend time with your horses to me it's not about a riding lesson it's not only just being in the ring and me teaching it's always off the, outside the ring, how much time we spend in the stable with them, knowing them, how much they eat, how much they drink, how much they, you know, oh, oh, what's their condition, how much hay they have. You've got to really live them and breathe them. Lovely. I think somebody asked, uh, did you have your own horse in Tiaz when you started? You want to answer You know, this is, this is a very lovely question, and I'm so glad you asked this. So this is comes back to, uh, we can entangle another question. People say, you know, it's so expensive, and you don't have the finances, and will it go to the masses? I was yeah. right till I started riding till I was 27, which is a long time. I never had my own horse. I had people give me horses. So I had those relationships with people. I worked hard. I was always in the stable. I always showed up. So it's always, it's, I keep telling people, it's not only work, work, uh, work hard, be talent, but it's also attitude. You're, how you come to work every day, you know, it's just, just working hard like a, like a dog doesn't always work that way. You know, you're not like a, a, a tractor that just put him in gear and keep working. It's, understanding people, understanding relationships. So people would just always give me horses. And I even went up to the national level, international level, and Asian games on horses that were given to me. It's only when I went for my final bid for my Olympic Games is when I got my own horse. So fascinating that uh, horses aside, it does, the other big thing is facilities. Uh, it's still considered to be better to be based out of Europe, right? Uh, for Admirza is also, I think, training in Europe somewhere. What, how, where are we in terms of year? How many so, light so, years away are we? 
we are quite a far away, and it's not only infrastructure because I understand because of the sport that we're in, we need a lot of space, a bit like a golf course. But there are many golf courses, so there definitely should be. We could have more equestrian places. But the problem is that we don't have any qualifying events in our country. That's one of our biggest problems in our sport. Every other sport, you can at least qualify in India, and then you go overseas for competition experience. You go overseas for coaching. You go overseas for expertise. We have to actually go overseas even to qualify. So that means we have to leave. Three to four years. If somebody wants to go to the next Olympic Games, this is now. Now is when it's already a bit too late. We already have riders who have left two and three years ago. Their family, their friends, things that they're used to, out of their comfort zone, and are based over overseas. It doesn't have to be in Europe. They could be in America. They could be in Australia as well. Any of these three places have the qualifying events. So you have to be based in those countries, live in those countries. It's not easy all the time, and it's very lonely. I mean, this path that we choose of, you know, we're going to do it. It, it, there are many times where things are not right and things don't go the way you are and you do get lonely, but you've got to th you always keep focused on the big picture, you know. Uh, so you, that's where it becomes a bit hard for us. How lonely is uh, individual sport, Imtiaz? Because I remember this even when I spoke with Abhinav Bindra and he said the same yes. thing that, you know, he had to leave, he, he had to go abroad and he was just in a tiny little hostel uh, training for years. Yes. But luckily his mom came along, but it can get really ro lonely in the mind as well, right? Yes, very, very lonely. I mean, again, for me, just like he had his mom, I had my horses, you know, so whenever it was yeah. very low, I would just go in the stable. I even slept in the stable, you know, because that's what was my comfort zone. You know, I did, you know, that was, I said, at least I'm here with my best friend and that was it. So it just gets hard. And, you know, those days now it's a bit easier because you have, you know, WhatsApp and you have phone and you can call home anytime. We didn't have all those access. There, was, there wasn't any what's, you know, so it was expensive to make phone calls and you just didn't do that, you know, and then again, depends which countries you are, time zones and all those sort of things make a difference, you know, everybody's sleeping when you're actually awake and sometimes you just want to hug, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm being honest, it's not like a man thing, but you just want to be with people that, or, or people that are where you just, you, you know, and it's not easy. Or just want to be with people, period. <laughs> <laughs> that's also true. But, you know, that's, that's a part of life and whatever you do, that's mm. why I tell people when I have my talks even with kids is that that is what it takes. So you have to push yourself, you know, it's about being comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. That's what it's about. It's about trying to be as comfortable as you can in something that is not comfortable. And don't expect it to be comfortable. That's where you make a mistake. Where, why isn't it perfect? No, no, no. It's not perfect. The world isn't. But we got to be as comfortable in this imperfect world. And it's a fascinating sport. I mean, a, a woman won the gold medal uh, yeah. at, at Tokyo. Uh, and it's also got, uh, there's also a larger shelf life uh, for the equestrians, isn't there? It's wonderful because it's the only sport where men and women compete at power. That's why I keep telling people sports like this is what India should actually develop is like, like we have archery, like we have shooting, like we have, uh, you know, golf, where there's no strength and stamina involved. It's tact and, and technique. So we should be, we can excel in those things. That's why we've done well in archery and shooting. You know what I mean? But everything is always focused on cricket. So you don't have any other options in any other sport. But this is what our advantage is. The second, as, as, as Bright Fulu said, a woman won the uh, a gold medal. It, there are more women in our sport, you know? So it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. It's, it, the sport is so, um, it's all about your relationship and your uh, bond with your animal that you can, and how well you perform. I'm going to take a couple of questions in Tiaz before we run out of time. Why did you stop yeah, yeah. competing at the higher levels? Is the question well, I think, it's a, I think one of the main reasons was it, it, uh, after a point, as I said, you know, there are a lot of sacrifices you made. Then you get a family and you have kids and, you know, you cannot be competing. At, our, our sport allows you to keep on going. But then it, it does affect somewhere because the amount of time and focus that you put when you're re riding at that level, uh, you know, it was eight to nine hours. Then it, it's not fair on the family. So that was one of my main, uh, main uh, reasons, you know. Sorry. Uh, the, the other thing is, how do you teach the children coming today? Uh, you know, you were dropped from the Asian Games. How do you teach them to handle setbacks? Because this is a generation that's very different in Piaz from what we are. Uh, everything is so instant. Everything is on a platter that, you know, they, they don't, they don't, you either play to win or nothing. Like I have to constantly exactly. tell the children, it, it's the game, learn the game, learn the sport. You don't have to know everything right in the beginning. But how do you teach these right. children today? No. That's what the love again with my sport, the horses do a lot of it, you know, like with yeah. my school right now, we are lots of times they try, they try like even today, just before I got, got on this call, I had lessons from four o'clock to six o'clock just before I came running in, had a shower to be ready. Uh, but it's all about, you know, putting them in a situation, then when it doesn't work, 
how they deal with it. So you have to put them in that. It's not always this perfect world, you know. Even for us, you know, when when we, I see kids play, my son's a tennis player, and you see these people, they say, no, no, it's always, oh, it's, everything's perfect. Don't, oh, lovely, great shot, wonderful. So they elevate them to a level which is not, that's not the way that it is. But me, I'm very blunt with my students. You know, I'm like, absolutely. This is what we have to work towards, you know. And it's, it's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. My trainer told me, if you have one step correct every day, you'll have 365 steps at the end of the year, which is more than enough that you need. So if you think of it that way, you need to give yourself time. So it's actually, it comes in the, in the training. And this is something I like to also stress on, that in India, we don't have enough mentors. Just so that's what we need more in our lives. In anything we do, not sport only, whatever we do, we have coaches. You know, a coach and a mentor is totally different. A teacher and a mentor is totally different. You know, we need people who are mentors who can be in our lives and support us through these things so that that's how we become better. That's how we can improve. That's how we can deal with failures because we have mentors. And that is something that we really need to get people, professionals to get back into the sport or get back and, be a, and mentor some kids. It doesn't have to be a large amount, but if everybody does their role of four and five, that's the giving back. It's only maybe one, one breakfast one day, one Zoom meeting one morning every month, you know, three, four times a year. It's for them to run some ideas through them, ask people, and it helps. So this is what will help. When there's a failure, you need to talk. You need to speak to people. Unfortunately, in India, we go straight direct to our family. Right. Our family is biased because they always protect us, you know. So it's good in a way, but at the same time, you need to speak some, to some people outside the family who will just, you know, make it a little bit more real, give you a little bit of a, 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 another analogy. You'll see another side of it, and then you realize, well, not too bad. They also fail. These are the reasons how they fail. But look, they're still successful now. So no, I totally agree because I, you, you, when you keep looking at the photos in the newspaper, now it's all about the winners, right? I mean, the, the yes. ones who, the ones who are <laughs> yeah. almost there have completely disappeared from the picture. Yeah, They're yeah, not. Yeah. They've gone back to their villages yeah. and but right, gone right, back right. to the tournament. It's, it's 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 very hard. And how do we change that? I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, if I think for for for, for uh, to start with, we have to first move out from cricket to. Uh, accepting, yes. be more accepting of other sto sports in totality and not just the ones that bring us the medal. I mean, hockey has been struggling to get into that limelight for a while, but you know, it's only yes. the medal that has, uh, but the men's team is gone. The women's team is nowhere yeah. in the picture again because they because it has to start. It, ha it has to start at the grassroots. We have to start at schools. We have to start at colleges. We have to start at the low level. For India, sport, I mean, you look at the good schools also, sport is an extracurricular activity. You know, that's the way they look at it. You know, for, for parents, sending their kid down to the playground is sport. So where are we going to go with? That is not sport, you know? Yeah, And physical uh, education, the class is the first one to get cut. I wrote about this last yeah. week. I mean, anything <laughs> that you're missing out in class, anything, you know, a teacher hasn't turned up. We cancel up the physical, teach, yes. We right. cancel the physical, so done and yeah. over same, with. Same, so I think, same. Even I know, sports day is one day. How can you have sports day be one day? Yeah. The person is running 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, yeah. all on the same day. And then the relay. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're expecting... Uh, second class. They're, they're, they're expecting mediocre performance and they're rewarding it. Simtaz, this is a question for you and it'll be the final question. 62-year-old uh, okay. won medal in equestrian event at Tokyo. You're just 50. Any chance of making a comeback? <laughs> I would like to know that as well. I would love to make a comeback. I, I, you know, I have to tell you, I love riding and I ride every day. So I'm fortunate enough that I'm fit enough and that's my absolute passion. Every morning at 5.30, that's the first thing I do is ride my horses. But riding at that level uh, is a lot of sacrifice on the family. And at this point, it's not, it's not the right timing. You've got to give a lot. And I've given my time. I've given everything. It's a very, you know, just like when you talk about being a, a lonely path, just it's also a little bit of a selfish path because it's all about you at that time, you know? So everybody's supporting you. Everybody's taking care of you. Everybody has to look after the things. I mean, if you read my book, even from college days, you know, I had friends of them doing my homework for me or, you know, collecting my notes while I was traveling back and forth from Bombay, Delhi, you know? So everybody has to support you to achieve what you have to achieve. So it's... Fantastic. You are giving back to the sport. We are hoping to see many more uh, people uh, participate uh, pa participate in uh, the next. Uh, are you hopeful about Paris? Yeah, always. We have to keep. I'm hopeful about everything. You have to always have hope because what's the point of living otherwise? That's also true. That is also the <laughs> wonderful last words, uh, Mthias. But that doesn't mean we won't uh, wish to see you again on the yes. on the horse one fine day. Maybe complete. <laughs> I mean, 62. Yeah. 62 is far away. You're still only Yes, it's yes, very far. <laughs> so we will and thank you so much for joining me a quick reminder no. Mthias's book Riding Tree is available in the bookstores please get your copy now
you will not regret it and uh, thanks for talking to me imtiaz wishing you all the no. best with all the maniacal book <laughs> promotions <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a story in itself but no. uh, but thank you so much for having me on this platform thank you for being able uh, for me to share this uh, journey that's what the book was about is to reach more people to just tell them it's an equestrian story and it's my story but it it's the stories that you can get out of it to say you know whatever it takes you, you know live your dream follow your passion and get out of your comfort zone those are the three messages and it comes in every chapter so uh, that's what i would just want to tell the younger generation of today and i think they need to hear it again and again yeah. in their names thank you so there much for is. joining me there is his <laughs> book please do get it i'm sorry all these <laughs> messages but i when it comes up on the recording it'll be all clean uh thank you so sure. much for joining me and uh, we will touch base again and all the thanks best thanks a lot thanks josna bye bye thanks